Welcome to the Andy Darer Show. This is episode 57. This week I'm joined by James Greer. He's an author, one-time bass player for Guided by Voices, and a past senior editor at Spin Magazine. We talk about his whole journey. Thank you so much for checking out the Andy Darer Show. Thank you so much for checking out the Andy Dare Show. Um, this is episode 57, and uh, I'm joined by an awesome guy, James Greer, one-time uh, member of Guided by Voices, current member and creator of the band Detective. They got a really cool new sound. Do check them out. And he basically spends most of his time being an author. He writes fiction. He also wrote an awesome book about his time in Guided by Voices and the whole story of Guided by Voices. Um, do check it out. I'm sure you'll enjoy the interview, but before we get into the meat of it, let me bring up my awesome sponsors. All right, first up, we have Uncle Bub's award-winning barbecue in Westmont, Illinois. Um, they've been on as a sponsor for a long time. I've been part of the Bub's uh, quote-unquote family for, for almost five years now, and uh, it's really cool business. Family-owned and operated since 1997. It's a family-friendly restaurant. They do the real deal barbecue open seven days a week, uh, pretty much just about 20 minutes west of downtown Chicago, close to all the major interstates so and all the major highways, so it's really easy to get to. Um, do check them out. Um, it's a great time, but also they do full-service catering that a lot of people don't even know about. They've uh, put on tons of weddings this summer, tons of pig roasts, luau's, corporate events. They can also just bring a, you know a buffet and set it up for you. I, uh, I've been doing pig roast this summer for Uncle Bubs. I think it's been the last three summers I've been doing pig roast for him. It's a great time, you know. It's a real piece, you know, a slice of Americana that people are really missing nowadays. And if you really want to have a party that people are going to be talking about next year, why don't you hire Uncle Bubs? Make it something worthwhile. And uh, I guarantee that your guests will never forget the party you had. If you have a pig roast, it's super fun. They get to bring the pig out, dress it up. Um, take pictures with it. People have a lot of fun doing that. And, uh, you know, you can definitely not do better than barbecue as far as I can tell. You know, culinary wise, I think when you smell a pig cooking in a smoker, there is nothing better than that smell. And I'm sure you will enjoy it. Uh, give them a call if you have any questions. 630-493-9000. And tell them the Andy Dare Show sent you for specials and offers. If you're in the Westmont area or the western suburbs of Chicago, do check it out. It's 132 South Cass Avenue in Westmont, Illinois, very close to the Stevenson. Can't miss it. And if you got uh, any concerns or questions, just check out UncleBubs.com. They got catering menus there, but give them a call if you have any questions. They have a friendly, helpful staff that are there to answer any questions seven days a week. And by Secondhand Mall. Uh, I actually talk, I think in this interview, I discuss it, um, my record store growing up for 28 years, remember when records, the guy just retired last year and sold out all the inventory to, to a secondhand mall type place, so now we still have the vinyl inventory, we still have a bunch of CDs, um, videos, DVDs, but now you also have power tools, you have vintage musical gear, awesome equipment that I didn't even know they were going to be stocking. So if you're a musician, do check it out as well. I'm trying to get an in-store in there, do you know, get the people out. I just remember going to stores when I was growing up and you didn't you weren't in a hurry, you were just, you know, shooting the breeze with the people that worked there, shooting the breeze with the other customers. It's a good time and I have I always have a good time when I go out to the secondhand mall. Um, it's also in Westmont, Illinois. Check them out at 309 West Ogden Avenue. Once again, you know, a pretty much a 20-minute drive from downtown Chicago or the north side of Chicago. Give them a call if you have any questions. They buy, sell, and trade. That's 630-810-9980. Tell them the Andy Dare Show sent you for specials and offers. And you can always check them out on the web. That's secondhandmall.com, a.k.a. 2ndhandmall.com. And bye. The Man Great, a premium chunk of Detroit steel that fits on your existing coat hanger-esque grill grate and instantly allows you to achieve steakhouse burgers, chicken, and fish. 
it just slides right on top of the chintzy grate that came with your nice grill. I don't, I don't understand why you spend, you know, 500 bucks, 800 bucks on a grill and they give you this little chintzy coat hanger-esque grill grate. If you just cook on that, you're basically just drying out your meats. You're, uh, you know, cooking with a, uh, a hair dryer, as they say on the commercial. But not no more if you get the man grates. And uh, it's an awesome gift for your father, awesome gift for your husband. Uh, don't want to be sexist here. A woman loves to grill just as much as a man does. And smelling that delicious meat cooking on the grill. So instantly achieve those dark grill grates that you, or grill marks that you have been able to get on your chintzy grate. So check it out. It's the man grate. If you want to support the Andy Dare Show, I got one answer for you. Just go to the right-hand side of our page at theandydareshow.com. And click through the Man Great banner, and then we get to keep the lights on here at the Honeycomb Hideout a couple more days longer. And I really do appreciate from the bottom of my heart all the orders we've been getting in. I'm sure it's not up to, you know, the Adam Carolla level, but it's a start. And I do appreciate it, you know. I, most of my sponsors here are local, but when I was approached by the Man Great, I said, why not? I'm a barbecue guy. I'm a Corolla guy. Let's make this happen. So click through the banner on the right-hand side of theandydareshow.com and get yourself a man great. All right, that's about it for the sponsors uh, this week. Um, actually, this last Thursday, I had an awesome opportunity. A longtime friend of mine, Bryce McDonough, he, uh, we've been chatting back and forth. He, he'd, he'd asked to be on the show back in the Fleetcast era. He'd asked to be on, a sh on the show during the Andy Dare show too. It's just I didn't have enough time. I've I've been booked pretty solid. So I said, "Hey, why don't you take over my Twitter? Why don't you come over to, you know, uh, the Honeycomb Hideout and uh, do some tweets for me?" So the guy did 3 hours straight of tweets on my Twitter handle at Andy Dare. And uh I got a lot of funny responses. A lot of people thought that I had just totally gone country and out of my mind. But uh yeah, I've got some here to read for you. I thought I'd just go through a couple um, since they are pretty funny. They're different. You know, usually I, I tweet about music and, you know, what I'm into musically. But um, Bryce had some funny thoughts, so I thought I'd share them. And I might actually just keep all these as a big paragraph or something and we could, uh, you know, publish it on the andydareshow.com. So here he goes. First off, Bryce McDonough. I'm just going to do it. I'm not going to try to do it in his voice. I'm just going to do it in mine. But this is from Bryce McDonough. Got a little gas on my hands at the pump. Slick back my hair with it because it drives, because nothing drives ladies well more than a little Texas tea in the pump. Here's the next one. You're looking at a closer. Here's the next one. Dear wrestlers, breaking a folding chair over someone's head is a great way to settle a disagreement. It sucks we can't do that in real life. I'm just a 6'4", 265-pound factory of smells, according to my wife. My daddy tells me all McDonough men have and have had tree trunk calves. Runs in the bloodline. Jesus, what happened to country radio? Finding a station that played George or Waylon's like finding a chick with all her teeth in Murfreesboro. My wife keeps giving me looks like, quit that tweeting and talk to your wife. Looking at stuff for work, I tell her. Tonight she's making Rockstar Energy roasted chicken, which is chicken marinated in Rockstar Energy, plus yams and greens. The way to a man's heart. I told, her I, I told Andy I wasn't going to profess my love for Chick-fil-A while I took over his Twitter tonight, so I'm just going to keep mums the word about it. Thank God, Bryce. Thank you. My daddy Braxton drove long haul in the early 90s, but got addicted to speed and pain pills and lived out of his cab for years. We lost touch. I'm just a honky-tonk outlaw stuck in a dubstep world. Let me tell you a little bit about how we do things over here at Bobcat. Dot, dot, dot. Hey, Brass Pro, are you heaven? There's a damn river in this store. With daggone fish in it, four exclamation points. Let her cry when the tears fall down like rain. You should hear my burly baritone do that old hootie classic, Do Justice. Well, guys, there's a reason I took over Twitter, Andy's Twitter tonight. I have news. Me and Linda are expecting. What, we should, what should we name him? Congrats, Bryce. Very cool. 
Something about me still wishes I could go back and get a delicious glass of Ms. O'Malley's fresh brewed sweet tea. She'd call me sweet tea. If Reba were to ever answer one of my emails, I would turn into a bowl of jelly and probably pass out from excitement. Thank you so much for hearing my goofiness for the last few hours. Listen to Andy's show over the an, at, over at the Andy Dare Show dot Podbean dot com. Country strong. So that's the Bryce McDonough Twitter feed uh, when he took over my Twitter last night for three hours. I thought you guys would enjoy. Thanks for putting up for, with all the antics on my Twitter. It's at Andy Dare. It means a lot to me. And, uh, yeah, basically what's going on the next couple of weeks for the Andy Dare Show, I'm uh, going to be guesting on the UP Music Podcast. Um, I will post all the pertinent info about that when they post it. I think it's going to be this upcoming Monday. So do check that out. I've also got a new side show called Smooth Operators with Tyler and Andy. That's with uh, Tyler Kale from Los Angeles. Um, do check it out. We've got two episodes in the can already, and uh, there should be another one out next week. So that about does it. I just want to thank everybody for listening, for uh, following the Twitters, for telling a friend. That's the most important thing you can do is tell a friend. It means so much to me doing this a year and a half into it. I want to thank James Greer, too. He's a great guest. I learned so much, and this is the whole reason why I'm doing this. You know, I'm learning about what I love, and I hope that you're going to learn along with me. So without further ado, my episode 57 with James Greer. Hey James, how's it going? You're on the Andy Dare Show. Hey, I'm good. How are you doing? Doing well. Um, yeah, thanks for taking the time out. Um, yeah, do you prefer James or Jim? You can call me Jim. Okay, cool. You can call me. Just me. You can call me. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I, I get the privileges here. Awesome. Yeah, I'd like to just uh, talk about a little bit about your uh, journey here. Um, but first off, I'd like to start with the last guy to buy voices show at the Metro. What was that? The New Year's Eve 04 to 05, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. And uh, <laughs> they brought out like a whole bunch of the lineup, you know, from back in the day till present day. And, uh, you know, Bob was overserved as always. But, uh yeah, how was that night? For we you? all were. That was um, well. I don't remember it that well, so, um, which might give you some indication of gotcha. how it was. But uh, uh, I was. Uh, what do I remember? Um, I know. I, I know. I went on stage at some point um, and played something. <laughs> but but I, 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 I had to, Greg Demos had, had had bought me like uh, four. He likes to drink these Jaeger bombs. I don't even know what a Jaeger bomb is, but. Sure. He enjoys them, and they're 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 like deadly. Um, uh, and he bought me like three or four, and then so by the time, whenever it was in the set that I came out, and I mean I couldn't even stand. I had to sit down <laughs> to play on the stage, and um, and I just I remember I think it was Johnny Appleseed. I think I played Johnny Appleseed, and um, and then uh, when I was done, I gave the bass back to to Chris Losarenko, sure. the bass player at the time, and and he said. Um, he said close, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't Pretty think close. I was even, uh, yeah, he's, he's like, you know, you were almost in key, you know, <laughs> I mean, you were almost playing the, the same song as everyone, which is, you know, as a guy, you know, for guided by voices really is not a, a, a requirement to even yeah. be playing the, the, the same song because Mitch often is playing a different song than, than, <laughs> than everyone else in the band. I mean, I, I literally, I mean, I can remember once, playing Roseland opening for Pavement and there was just this one song and we just thought he was really out of out of, out of tune or something it was so bad you know and, and Bob like whatever the song was I think it might have been Always Crush Me okay um, nice. and he was playing King and Caroline or something I don't know <laughs> he was playing just an entirely different song which we didn't find out until afterwards you know we were like what happened on that song he's like well I was playing this song and it was a, and Bob didn't. He just, that, that, that's the what I'm talking about. Is like Bob didn't even stop the song. <laughs> he like just he he adapted his melody to whatever the new guitar you know. Line, huh? yeah. yeah, well, whatever this weird atonal thing that was coming out because Toby and I were playing a completely different song than Mitch. And Mitch, Mitch's volume is roughly twice as loud as <laughs> uh, as the other side of the stage. So it kind of just 
at least it's stage volume. I don't know how it sounds out front. Um, he does that where you keep going back and turning it up just a little bit so people don't, so the other guys in the band don't notice, but you keep throughout well, the night. Yeah. He, he, no, he's always he's always loud. We, I mean, he's always been loud, which was a problem not for us, but for, for, for like sound men in some clubs where I can remember a club in, in Atlanta where they um, – they actually asked him to turn his amp backward, around backwards, so it faced <laughs> the wall, and uh, because it was just so loud, they couldn't manage the stage sound or whatever, it. something. And of course, we, you know, that's ridiculous, so we didn't do it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, he's just like that's why I always like it's on YouTube when you see the live shows. If they're standing on Mitch's side of the stage, I'm like, oh, oh no, <laughs> you know, it's like they're, they're like they've made a mistake. You know, it's not going to sound right because all you're going to hear is Mitch. Once you got to pull sticks in, you know, to like, yeah, see who doesn't have to be yeah. on his side. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't use any – I mean, like, he just has the Marshall that is modified. He's got a Marshall head at least – I don't know what he's using now, but he used to have a Marshall head that was modified, like, to go – it was, like, 200. It goes to 11, you know. I mean, sure, actually, yeah. it goes to 12, <laughs> I think. And it, it was modified to be to be louder than, uh, like, in a 100-watt hun, head. It was, I, I think, modified to 200 or something like that. Oh, jeez. But, <laughs> but it was just um, – but, yeah, he had no pedal. He plays at basically one volume. Um, You're saying like no you know, pedals for Mitch? Yeah, no, no. Oh. Yeah. Uh, he says he has a, a phase pedal that he sometimes plays. Because I, I was asking him because we're borrowing their back line when we tour with them later uh, uh, in September. Nice. So I was asking him what he, you know, what just what what amp he has now, and he was he was saying, and, and he's like, oh yeah, you want? To, he's got, so I've got. A, he just sets his like he has his setting, and then he. um he, there's a master volume knob in the back, apparently, that he just uses. Huh. Weird. It's the only thing he ever changes. Are you guys so going to me- you guys gonna be supporting Guided by Voices when they play the Metro next month, or not till September? No, no, not till September. It's just logistically that would be because you know we're I'm in uh, Los Angeles and it's just uh, that would be logistically complex. Gotcha. Let's say problematic. I mean, we're starting in uh, Athens, Georgia, and basically going through till. Uh, St. Louis. Oh, awesome. Um, so it's sort of a sort of the south and southwest kind of you know through to Austin, Houston, Lawrence, Kansas, I don't know, New Orleans, places like that. Good and, crowds over there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just it's mainly because it's places that that he hadn't really played. You know, what well, Austin they they played um, in the first round of the re- reunited thing, but they didn't really get down to. To Florida and Georgia and and New Orleans and places like that on the reunion tour, so um, so they wanted to do some of those. Just things. filling in the dots, yeah. Huh. Yeah, you know, kind of just playing places they hadn't played before. Even though this is now, you know, I mean, they're playing like I, what seems to be like you know eighty to ninety percent of the new stuff oh, um, okay. on this particular tour, um, as opposed to. Uh, you know the reunion one where they just played the all the hits, stuff. yeah, the classics, yeah, the hits, basically. Well, yeah, I mean they played stuff literally. I mean the, the the idea was to confine themselves to just that period between. Well, I mean they could play some earlier stuff, but no later than under the bushes, under the stars. The classic um, lineup, really. yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I mean the stuff that came after that uh, also. I mean, in addition not to being that that, that lineup really was, um, it was a different. I mean, it was it, it was actually more. Com- it was harder to play. Let's just put it that way. Sure. The band was, um, you know, with Doug Gillard and everything. He was a much more uh, technically accomplished guitar player. So I, you know, I, I think they would have had trouble playing some of the later stuff. Oh yeah, this like the stuff like Teenage FBI and stuff like a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, or glossy. just even yeah, yeah. I mean, the stuff that the stuff that's yeah, the stuff like like I mean, this is too easy, but you know, like I Am a Tree, which is Doug's song. Um, but you know, the riff on that. I mean, I don't think. Uh, there, there's probably only a few people who can play that. <laughs> sure, yeah. One of them is Doug, you know. Um, and just the, that, that's fine. I mean, you know, but but so there's sort of, I mean, but there are definitely songs on there that that the guys could play. It's just a question of you know, wanting Bob wanting to go to the trouble of learning them. Sure. There's a certain element of laziness involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I give that DVD the electrifying conclusion to all my friends that are into music. And at a time when rock was so sterile and just so self-serious, 
you guys were just having so much fun. Bob was having so much fun. He was like your your drunken uncle that you just love talking to at the holiday party, kind of. And uh, yeah, the Metro just celebrated 30 years this past week. The guy, the owner, Joe Shannon, couldn't be a nicer guy. He's totally reached out to me and stuff. And uh, yeah, he really put himself on the line when he started that place back in '83. Um, I get, or I guess '82. His first thing he had, to, his first booking was an, a young REM right off the Murmur tour, and uh, he put all of wow. his, yeah, put all of his power into this. They said, yeah, we'll give you one last try. If you can't fill it up for this next gig, then we're gonna start selling the place or get rid of it. And uh, yep, it was REM, and the you know future was sealed for him pretty much. Oh, that's so. good. That was that was a that was a good booking, I guess. That was a good call. Exactly. Um, yeah, no, the Metro's a good place. I I I, I played there. We, I think I played there a couple times in Guided by Voices. Uh, I I know that I'm pretty, I'm almost positive. I mean, I have a very I've been there a bunch of times, and it just depends with you know. So my memory, you know, because it was so long ago, my my the memories kind of meshed together of whether, whether sure. I was there with the band or there in the band. Gotcha. So, but I think I was there in the, I, I, rem, I have a very specific memory of actually sound checking there. It's a really nice, um, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, the, the, the anniversary show, but that one was just like, that was a seriously a drunken, blur. I mean, I just, <laughs> but I mean, like back in the original, I think back when I was in the band in 94, 95, it was, you know, we definitely played the Metro at some point. I mean, we played Lounge X more. Sure, Lounge more X, that was commonly. owned by a, uh... Tweedy's wife or Jeff Tweedy's wife, I think, or she bought it from him or something. Wait, well, then, now is it still open? I mean, no, it's I, been about ten years or something. Yeah, it's been yeah. at least ten. Yeah, yeah, that was a shame. I mean, I and it was it was an issue with um, I guess noise really. I mean, like the neighbors were complaining more than like more than just like a, a financial matter. It seemed like what I was hearing. I don't know. I mean, I'm not all the yuppies. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they were just, you know, it was a zoning issue or something like that, which seemed like kind of a... I'm trying uh, to walk my lap dog, and I don't want to hear rock and roll blasting at, at all hours. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I mean, I, I guess if I lived there, I think if you lived there and you're like, it, would, it could be annoying. But, I mean, it's a city, right? Yeah. I mean, you know. Get out of the city. Like, <laughs> so you grew exactly. up in the, in the East Coast, right? Or... Yes. Yeah, I, grew, I, I was born in Boston, and I lived in New York for mm, seven years or so. So I figure creative writing was big for you in high school, or um, was the music more? Yeah, I mean, I was always, a, I always had uh, ambitions to be a, a writer. Yeah, um, uh, I didn't really take any writing classes per se, but um, but yeah, I mean, uh, it's funny that you say that because it's like, I think when I was like, I remember uh, when I was I don't know, ten or eleven, I I told my mom I wanted to be a creative writer, <laughs> but I didn't know what that meant. I don't think I knew what that meant. I mean, what is that? That doesn't mean anything. That's very true. I want to be a creative writer. I want to be a creative writer. I'm like, what? Well, no, I want to be an uncreative writer. Is, you know, <laughs> yeah, who's an uncreative writer? I don't know. No, I know. Well, yeah, most, of them, um, most of them, actually. Sports um, reporter. But, but that's, uh, um, I, yeah, I mean, um, I guess that guy that just that, that, that fired from the New Yorker for, for plagiarizing um, or making up quotes, he's a pretty creative writer. Oh, jeez. He made up Dylan quotes. <laughs> It's like this guy. He's famous, Joe, Jonah Lira or something like that. He, he didn't actually. He didn't get fired, but he got. He had to resign. He's more of a science writer, but he was writing a book. He wrote a book called Imagine, which I think was something to do about neuroscience. But he was using examples from creative people. Okay. And um, apparently, he just fabricated some quotes from <laughs> Dylan and somebody. Some and you can't. Which you just you can't do that with certain people. You can't do it with Dylan because there's too many fanatics out there that know everything he's ever said, you exactly. know, that read every interview. It's the same things like if you tried to make up Bob quotes, well, it'd be, it's a little different with Bob quotes because like Bob wouldn't remember whether he did, <laughs> whether he said it or not. So, you know, you could, and he's not like, you know, he's not as sort of um, culturally pervasive, let's say, as, as, as Dylan is, I suppose. But, um, well, um, especially with the internet nowadays, I mean, everything is an easy lookup now. It seems like. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, luckily for 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 me, anyway, um, uh, a lot of the stuff, uh, you know, back back in the even to the mid '90s was not, uh, put, you know, available online, and so and so just isn't sort of now. I mean, the guy who runs the Guided by Voices database, GVB, G, GBVDB, um, 
I don't know if you've seen it. It's sure. you know, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's like it's this insanely comprehensive thing, and he's got he scans stuff. You know, I mean, he takes like set lists. I sent him things, you know, because I had like boxes full of stuff like old um, tour nice. uh, schedules and set lists and things like that, and um, I would send him stuff just because you know better him have it than me because I'll lose it. Exactly. Um, right. And uh, you know he'll scan stuff, but he's you know he's 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 really comprehensive and I mean sort of in what I would describe as an unhealthy way but I mean <laughs> you know I mean that's 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 I mean I, thank God for for that I mean I, I've just never been that kind of a um obsessive fan um but I mean I, I appreciate anyone who is sure but, yeah you know and and he's gone to so much trouble he's not you know it's not he's not making any money off it. it's a total labor of love so um but you know his battery. He's got like this, not just every show that was ever played, but like pretty much, set and it, with with some rare occasions, he's got the 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 set list for every show that it was ever played. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, he he indicates whether there's you know bootleg audio that exists or video. And I'm always surprised to see how much it says how many times it says yes and who has all these things. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> You know, I mean, like, like you know, like shows like from the nine, from ninety three, ninety four, ninety five that were apparently recorded. It's almost like here. a level of fanaticism that's like reserved for jam bands, you know. Yeah, like, kind of. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, like the Deadhead type of thing. Yeah, um, and the yeah, the Fish, whatever Fish, I guess, took over from them, and I don't know who takes over from them, but yeah, the tape trade that it was notoriously, I mean, Grateful Dead were. were and even actually, I guess Pearl Jam is a little bit like that. They're fans. Sure. They yeah. trade their live shows. They're they're kind of famous for um, the the fans trading live shows, or and they put out didn't they put out like a massive set of live. Yeah, they put like the thirty uh, single CDs out of every show for one tour, I believe, just to cut out the right. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. I mean, which is you know whatever. I mean, um, that's. That's cool. How did I mean, Pollard you, feel about I, like, Ticketmaster? I never even thought of that. Were you guys through Ticketmaster in the mid '90s? I have no idea. I, I don't think we even ever were. I wouldn't care aware to. enough. Well, I mean, it, it is. He's he's pretty. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think it would be fair to say, yeah, he would he wouldn't he wouldn't really understand. It, the only thing that would, he would understand it if if they were taking money out of what we were making. He would definitely that would bother him. <laughs> sure. Um, I, which I don't I don't know if it was, and I don't really honestly I don't know if we were at the level where we were going through Ticketmaster. I don't even know. Um, we were just he prefers uh, to deal with the the business side as little as possible, and so um, I mean that would be something that you know he wouldn't ask about. He wouldn't even know about. It wouldn't occur to him to think about. Is that like Rockathon's deal then, or? Well, no, I mean it was just you know we they had you know we we were on Gold Mountain, um, and, you know we had the same manager as you know. Oh, John Silva? Uh, uh, no, it was um, it was Janet Billy. Oh. Um, for a while, she, and she did the uh, she was you know she managed she was co-managing Nirvana. She managed more she was more managing Courtney. Um, but um, but yeah, no, John we knew John very well, but he's a West Coast guy, and he was sort gotcha. of. You know, he had his back and his Beastie Boys, and um, a little busy. <laughs> you know, and and you know, obviously Nirvana for for a while, but that was actually weirdly that was that was that was Kurt's suicide was sort of post. Maybe it was just before REM. I mean, he never probably got to hear Guided by Horses. Huh. Um, yeah, that was, that was early ninety early ninety four, and. It's weird because he, you know, he died in April '94, and I was in the band in August '94, which is something I always forget. So, so B Thousand had not been released. When was B Thousand released in '94? That's a good question. Um, it might have just been released in that month. Um, uh, I don't really know the. Well, it was Scat off, first, off right, and then uh, yeah, it was Scat, and then. Scott. Yeah, well, I mean, Scat had a distribution deal with Matador, is my, oh. if I remember correctly, already. But um, but then, um, so so we didn't actually sign to Matador proper um, uh, until Alien Lanes. Oh, okay. And uh, um, so it was always, but I think at a certain point, you know, I mean, you know, Scat had a distribution deal, and then 
the record obviously you know got some attention and the band started getting attention. I think Matador sort of more actively took over at that point in the sense of you know probably re- repressing it and and distributing it more widely. I don't remember exactly. Again, this is stuff I should. I mean, you know, I've, um, since I haven't really thought about it. Got to ask the kid from the GBV DB site, right? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, he, I mean, the the thing is, like, yeah, if I could just go on, like, you know just go on Amazon or something, it'll, it usually has a release date, which is not always accurate, but um, but generally speaking, it is. With that particular record, it's it's a little bit, like, as you say, <clears throat> um, less clear, I think, um, because it uh, it was initially, I don't think anybody knew it was going to be that, as huge as it was. Oh, yeah. Um I mean, not you. I mean, you know what I mean. It was well, as as or get as um, get as much attention, I guess, um, as it. I mean, it, when was it? Like I first saw kind of big voices in I guess, in the fall of '93. I guess it would have been because um, and they'd only first played their first show was in July of '93 <clears throat> at the <clears throat> at CBGBs. So um, and it was weird, you know. Of course, I saw them in New York. Because you know they didn't, they had given up. It says June twenty first here, oh, June twenty first ninety four. So it's so Kurt suicide was April ninth or something like that. If you guys were more so, part yeah. of Kurt's like region, like the Pacific Northwest, I'm sure he would have heard some of you know uh, same place the fly got smashed or you know propeller or all those early well, tapes. I mean, you know, he no, was kind of was a really hard. Nobody was hearing. Nobody heard that stuff. And nobody even in New York. There were like two people. Really. Um, huh. And not only that, they had only discovered them in. Uh, and like, because Scat had picked up Propeller, oh. that that you know, a couple people like Mark Eibold and, and Matt Sweeney got a hold of those records almost by accident. Even then, you know, just because they had you know, whatever. Um, and there there are people in Columbus, you know, who, who who were from you know, sort of like spreading the word a little bit, but it just hadn't really, like I said, until they played. Um, what was then, I believe, the new music seminar still existed, um, oh, huh. uh, and and it was um, it, it was you know a CBGB show, but everyone was there. You know, it was kind of a very buzzy type of show, um, apparently, and uh, and that was their first live show. And, and you were was, in the crowd? Know, no, I was not. I wasn't oh. at that show. Oh, okay. I was in I was in San Francisco with the. Probably record, you know, on that yeah, I was gonna going to ask about the spin, the whole spin thing. You were senior editor uh, in the early '90s before uh, the whole GBV thing. Yes, yeah, I started there in like '89, '90, something like that, and uh, <clears throat> I was, um, you know, I was, a, I was a senior editor. I, I did mostly the record reviews back then. I mean, there weren't. That, I mean, it was a very it was a it was a, a shoestring operation more or less because it really, like it wasn't it started in eighty five I think and it was not doing it was kind of hanging in there but I mean we weren't it was kind of month to month gotcha we huh. weren't um, and we were we there were so like you know as my official duties were to like you know do, run the record review section but you ended up doing everything else a little bit of everything else wrote a lot of the features. Because you know they just we couldn't afford that. We, we were paying, um, and I know this sounds ridiculous nowadays when no one gets paid, but um, at the time this was a really low rate. We were paying twenty five cents a word, huh, I think, really, <laughs> um, which was really low compared to like Rolling Stone was paying probably a dollar a word. Sure, yeah, um, that's crazy. And so you know we, we couldn't, and even at twenty five cents a word, we weren't paying like, and this is notorious with all magazines, so it's not just, but we weren't paying necessarily very timely. Um, and there was like a lot of complaints from writers, so there were probably writers that would rather not, you know, it just we couldn't get. So we had to, you know, basically we did a lot of stuff in the house that normally would be done um, by by freelance. How about this? Um, Any time you put out a review and uh, the artist or band got back to you, they were they were mad at your review or held a grudge. Or? Well, you know, you would uh, you would. Um, the only time I can remember that happening really uh, in a real sort of kind of serial comic way was when I think the, the, the then music editor at the time wrote a pretty scathing review about, or something, review or feature about NWA, and they came up to the office 
Uh-oh. Like, the entire, <laughs> in the entire sort of, like, not a huge, I mean, the elevator couldn't hold that many people, but, I mean, like, but 10 or 11 guys, and he actually went out the fire escape. Oh, man. He was so scared of them. He, um, he, he fled out this fire escape. I don't think, I mean, they were kind of like, they, they, I don't even think they got past reception. Not that there would have been, not that it would have been difficult because there was no, you know, there was no, it was a, there was not any security or anything like I'd that. I'd be hiding in the broom closet. Yeah, shaking. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I wasn't there. So, you know, it didn't happen. I mean, it happened to be like, because I, I, was, I was traveling a lot. I mean, that was the, the great thing about it was, well, I mean, um, was that, you know, you would be uh, off doing stories a lot of the time, you know, with bands on the road. And, um, you know, that since we had no money, you know, normally you don't, I mean, like Rolling Stone, and now again, you know, you wouldn't do this. God, it's like Spin just finished, I just remembered Spin is like no longer a print magazine. Yeah, it's I read weird. a tweet about that. I was going to ask you about the details, what they're just doing an online yeah. thing now? Yeah, yeah I, I just they canceled the November December issue, which I mean, I, it's always a bad time. I don't remember when they moved to bi monthly, or, or you know, like every two months. That's always a bad sign. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just tough. It's tough. it's obviously tough for any print magazine, and the ones that are surviving are just like sort of the ones that have, were always big. Sure. Like I and talked to David Wilde uh, from Rolling Stone about a month ago. Yeah. They're still doing well, but they do also have to put you know Justin Bieber on the cover saying like legal yeah. and hot and ready. You know, so yeah. I mean, it's a given. Uh, I mean, you know, that's not like it, that's. I mean, look, they they put they're probably their most best selling cover uh, was Jim Morrison on the cover. He's hot. He's sexy. He's dead. That's true. Yeah. I mean, that, <laughs> That that was like you know it's not like Jan Winter has ever been averse to since certainly since the mid I would say well since they went to a to a, to a glossy format whenever that was I think in the mid 80s maybe it might have been earlier than that and he started putting movie stars on the cover rather than you know it became more than just a music magazine it became sort of it went from like a hippie rag like to a yuppie yeah. glossy magazine yeah sure. yeah exactly and so I mean you know at that point and you know. But, I mean, they still published a lot of great oh, yeah, journalism. They are great. Yeah. Um, but, but um, I mean, I don't. But you know, it's it's just a, it's a really tough atmosphere, right? I mean, you know, just just for print, which is you know, I don't I don't know, I don't, I'm not, I've been out of journalism for a long time, or I, I hesitate to call what I did journalism, but anyway, but I've been out of that sort of with the media, the magazine world for a long time, so. I don't really have a good grasp on, you know, the or an opinion, an informed opinion, let's say, about the um, sort of the, the death of print, other than it clearly is happening. Yeah, I can see um, like a parallel with like Pitchfork. They're they're like pretty big right now. They never even did sure. a print magazine, and now they're starting fests, Pitchfork fests, making millions off right. of that. So I think well, see, they've kind of got is, that. Here's the thing. I mean, uh, and somebody made this point. It's not. It's not. Me, it's not an original point, but but it's a good one. Is that you know, t- in particular with music, it's tough with print because you're up against you know Pitchfork, but but any you know Stereo Gum, all these webs. Well, actually, Stereo Gum is Buzz Media, which now owns Spin. So I mean, oh. that's probably the direction they'll go in. Gotcha. But the thing that you can't compete against, the thing a print magazine can't do, is you can't embed a YouTube video or an MP3 or a stream, you know, of the band, which is just a much better way of, uh, you know, consuming music, if you will. You know, I mean, you know, when, when you when you're reading about a band in a magazine, you know, that's you're limited to the, you know, to, to the sure, writer yeah. talking about or, or the band being interviewed, which is which you know, is still people want to have that, but they also want to be like, you know, when the guy's talking about the record, they want to be able to just press play and hear the song. You know, I mean, I want to. Everyone exactly. You know, it's yeah. just it's a much better format. Um, the, the, the internet based thing is just a much better format for presenting music. I don't know if that's a, you know that's not necessarily the case for other forms, you know, uh, you know like the Atlantic or, or the New Yorker. I think the New Yorker I, it probably loses money, but you know it's, I, I don't think it's in any danger. Of, probably um, not. Yeah, I wish uh, been well and, though. And, I mean, know, yeah. and it does, you know, I mean, and, and it publishes great stuff still because and it, it can it, it can afford to because. I mean, it's sort of a cultural institution, I guess. But you know, again, it's not 
they might have multimedia components, but it's about the writing. You know what I mean? It's about the story. Sure. Yeah. Um, even when it's you know, you know, even if it's just a, a profile of a, of a, even if it's a music profile, it's still about the writing and about the story, which you know it's hard to do in a purely music-based magazine. People want to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing that Rolling Stone does right is uh, a lot of times they'll have a celebrity or a musician write an article about another musician, and those I feel like more it's like an intimate uh, conversation with with these guys instead of just like a random writer. It's kind of a neat way to take it, and I, I know they've been doing that for years with you know Hunter S. Thompson in the '70s and stuff like that, and where the writers well, were actually no, I mean, considered I mean, stars uh, themselves. Yeah, I mean if there's that's. That's a specific type of, of, of journalism, the Hunter S. Thompson model, the, the gonzo journalist, and that's the only something that very few people, very few writers could pull off. Very few. Unfortunately, more than a few tried it. Um, you know, it's just, in general, it's not a good idea uh, to to make yourself the focus of a story about another. That's true. It's about yeah. somebody else. But, you know, if you can... If you're if you're Hunter S. Thompson, you can do it um, um, because what he was writing about it was rarely what he was you know, the, the ostensible subject of the story, and and he was just really good at it, you know. And he wasn't really writing about himself; he was just writing about other stuff, you know. He yeah. turn a, you know a story about the Super Bowl into you know whatever a, a political allegory or something, you know, whatever. I mean, yeah. obviously. Fear, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas it was, was supposed to, it was originally commissioned by Sports Illustrated. He was supposed to go there and cover that, you know, that, you know, this bike, this uh, motorcycle race the heart, yeah, in the okay. desert or something, you know, and that's what, and, 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 you know, of course, they rejected it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, all the better for him, you know, at the end of the day. How about like a rock writer that you looked up to when you were just beginning in the late 80s, early 90s for spin? Um. Good question. Like, um, Kurt Loder was doing I stuff, mean, and I mean, who? Well, I mean, the obvious models, you know, for rock writers at that time are still probably the people that you know, like Richard Meltzer and um, sure. and Lester Bangs. Um, although I hadn't really read, you know, it wasn't as easy to access that stuff uh, back then. I mean, Cream was the magazine that I think in the seventies a lot of people uh, sort of. Sort of venerated, and there were a lot of great writers that came out of that, like Richard and Lester. But that, that, Richard, in particular, had already by the time I was long before the time I was writing, actually, um, he just become completely disillusioned with music. I mean, that's that's one of the hazards of the profession, I guess, is that you know, sure. you get burnt out. Yeah. You get you get burnt out. You get jaded. Whatever. I mean, you know, it, he, he it happened to him at a very early time. I think I think basically. He stopped being interested in rock music in the in the late '60s, and then again, kind of picked up again during the the hardcore era, the, during that you know Black Flag. He was interested in that whole LA, specifically Los Angeles scene at that time. Nice. Um, uh, but you know, and he's a huge Guided by Voices fan, which is also not surprising <laughs> in one way. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he got he went to a show and um. This is like, you know, post, I mean, this is like probably 2000, 2001 or something when he first heard them even, oh. or saw them live. Huh. And of course, you know, just like, like you know, he was a huge fan. You know, when I when I did the book, um, which, you know, sort of a command performance, I was, Bob called me up and said, remember Remember ten years ago when you were in the band and I said you would do the book whenever I broke up the band and I said no, <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't remember that. And he, but sure, you know. So it was kind of like I kind of didn't have much choice about that, and you know there were certain. I loved you know, it, I mean, by the way. Was, yeah. Thanks. I mean, it was it was you know there was uh, first of all I had it was like he calls me up in October and then you know I I I, I called my friend who happened to be. Uh, uh, an editor at a, at a book publisher and said, you know, do you guys want to do this? And they were like, yes, but like, when does the band break up? Well, they, they break, you know, the last show is in a couple months. Oh, so they wanted the book out as soon as possible. So I had like, you know, I had like two months to put the whole thing together. Um, wow. I didn't know and, that. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I went on a few of the dates of the, of the last 
tour, uh, which is the New York show and obviously the Chicago show and maybe a couple other ones. And then, you know, I went to Dayton and did a lot of and interviewed, but, and, but I did a lot of phone interviews, you know, like with the other, with the sort of the non-members of the group, you know, the, you know, when I, uh, talking to Gerard Cosloy or people from, you know, people from Matador or, 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 you know, Robert Griffin from SCAT and stuff like that. So people, you know, I love yeah, I love the table of all the members and how they're all like uh, linked together, you know, by these all oh, these yeah. different groups and projects. That's interesting. Definitely. Yeah, Bob did that. I mean, I should be up. Someone should update that because I'm saying it could be it could probably stand an update, but at this point, because you know, it just keeps pro- proliferating. Because, sure. You know, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Doug joined and does news. I mean, there's been so many uh, ex members. Um, I mean, not so much. Not so much since the early '90s. That just kind of stabilized once, uh, once E Thousand came out. It was. I mean, there was definitely changeover, but I mean, it was it was not as rapid as in the early days when they didn't have a record label and, and like 30 people went through the band because you know, um, it just you know, there was no there was no money in it. There was no anything in it um, except so you had to really love the music and you know, I mean and and you had to be as fanatical about it as Bob was, and 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 I don't think anyone was mm-hmm. that way, except maybe, you know, except maybe you know, except the people who who were like the core people, like Toby, who I mean, who wasn't there at the beginning, but you know, he was there pretty early on, and and Greg, same thing, you know, came in around the same 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 place. Sure, yeah, that's awesome. Um, uh, yeah. Era. How about like taking it back to the early '90s? I know you, you were engaged to Kim Deal and. Uh, what kind of like did you play a role in the breeders? Did you help them record it? What was the, like what was your uh, role with them here? Moral support. I, I nice. <laughs> was my uh, was my. I mean, I I I, I if, I'm, if my if memory serves, I think I may have played some some Moog, synth or Moog or however you pronounce that uh, synthesizer sure. on 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 Last Splash. But um, I mean that was like, you know, noise, white <laughs> noise or whatever. Um, I mean that was, and. It, if I'm remembering it correctly, it was like, you know, it was like 10 minutes in the studio and I was already like, I, I was like, uh, we were already fighting. You know, it was like, you know, it's just, it's like, it's very difficult. People, people Bob, both Bob and, and like, I, I guess anyone, creative artist, like Kim, uh, just very, you know, have very specific visions and, you know, very specific ways they want to do things and, and, and they can be very hard to work with. <laughs> she um, doesn't bite her tongue. I mean, Bob yeah. can be, Bob. Bob can be very hard to work with. I mean, there's no denying that because he he's you know he's he it's his way you know and he wants things his way and um uh you know and that's fair enough. I mean, it's his band. I mean, he's never made any. I mean, it's not like he he he's it's not clear. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like you know and it's like Billy Corgan with the Smashing Pumpkins and yeah. Well, I wouldn't say he's that. You know, he's definitely not a, that much of a. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to, you know. I mean, Bill, he's got his own thing. I mean, Bob's much more easygoing in, in most ways. He's not a musical tyrant, you know what I mean? Because, uh, and that's part of his, I was always convinced, you know, when I was uh, when I was playing on, you know, like on Alien Lanes and on some of the Under the Bush, just stuff like, you know, that he didn't really know. He didn't really even listen to the bass parts, <laughs> you know. I was just convinced. So I, I mean, unless it was really out, you know, unless it was out of out, you know, something that really clashed, he didn't really didn't care what you played, um, for the most part. At least with, I. So you're lucky. The bass part, the bass, lucky. The bass players are lucky <laughs> in that sense because he didn't really. And and to be fair, you know, when you're when you're recording to a, to a four track cassette, there's often there were there are a few songs where I was just like, there's no room for me to put a face on, on this and there's no need for it you know you just can't it's just you know this it's just like um it would be it would be it would, no one would hear it anyway but you know i would like for instance on uh i mean there's some songs that i don't listen i don't go back and listen to it that like, often but a salty you know, salute like, um, you got a little bass line chug in there well I mean, yeah i mean that's that one's pretty off that's a riff based song but kind of like a bit but 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 like a my son cool 
Brent, I can remember putting that. I, I didn't even think there was a bass on it. I listened to it in headphones, and I heard, like, the bass. And I was like, oh, right. <laughs> Whoa, there but I there am. are some songs that that there aren't bass on. A lot of the ones that, because Toby would bring instrumentals, or sometimes just he, Bob and Toby would work on stuff. And like often, uh, like I'm pretty sure on King and Caroline that there's no bass. It, for instance, it's just Toby playing. He would play. He often played bass lines on his guitar. <laughs> sure. Um, and uh, very nicely. He was a very, very melodic and very. But it's like that's the way the only way it would come through on the four track is if you did it on the guitar, you know, I mean, uh, and there's just some, some that just didn't have it, didn't need it. Like all, all right. The instrumental, all right. Just, it's like three guitars <laughs> and no, and drums and no bass. It's funny in the, in the um, age of computer recording and well, cakewalk or pro tools or whatever, I still like my task and Porta studio four track. And, uh, yeah, oh, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm mixing the vocals. One? Yeah. I'm mixing the vocals right now through it. So yeah, one of those blue task games. So, and yeah. that brings me yeah, to no, I, uh, Steve Albini, a friend of the show. Obviously, um, we've been in his in his recording studio interviewing him a couple, and uh, he he's got a bad rep, you know, it precedes him, but he couldn't have been nicer or more funny or more laid back when we got to him, you know, a year ago. So I don't know if he's changed or what, but I always ask no, people when I have changed. my. He's always been. He's always had a bad. I mean, he's always. I, I don't know where that. I think that comes from like some. Sometimes the way he he he, he writes, you know, like when he used to write, like he would write into forced exposure. It's his sense of humor in a way sure. that gets him in trouble. <laughs> You know, he'll be kind of caustic about other bands or something. Or non PC. Yeah. Used to be, but only in writing. You know, like in person, he's definitely opinionated, but he's he couldn't be nicer. He, he's the, he's one of the nicest people, one of the easiest to work with people that I've ever um, had the pleasure of, and that was definitely true. I mean, uh, I, oh, God, I don't know. I mean, like his, we, his studio used to be in his house. Yeah. And, um, and so you could, you know, you, you he'd let you stay there. You know, you stay. You know, obviously there wasn't a lot of room. I slept on the couch. I, I do remember I accidentally he had like this uh, P.J. Harvey gold record because he did rid of me, right? Record. Yeah. So he had a gold record for that and was just propped up against a bookshelf. And I went over and I like like to look at it and I I, I broke it. Oh. <laughs> and it, it slid down behind the bookcase and it kind of shattered. And he was like, I was like, oh man, I'm really sorry. He's like. It's like oh, I don't care. Okay. Like I don't care about a goddamn you know, awesome. PJ Harvey Gold <laughs> record. Which I mean, that was I was mortified. I mean, you know, that was just. Um, and he maybe he did care, but 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 he he totally did not. You know, he totally did not make me feel bad about it or anything. I mean, he's just. Um, I mean, he's done so much for. I mean, he's such a good engineer. First of all, for just to start with, you know, start it off with, and. Um, uh, His drum sound just, alone, I mean, will put him in the oh Hall God, of Fame yeah. for me. Yeah. So. Yeah. And he's, I mean, he just knows. You know, I mean, it's not. It's not. It's not like he just arrived at that drum sound out of. I mean, he studies the physics of sound. You know, to the sure. point where he, you know, he, you know, when he's when he's miking the snare drum, he knows. You know, like the way that with the, the 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 waves are gonna when you hit the drum how the bottom head vibrates and how to <laughs> mic that in a way so that it doesn't come or that it does you know that yeah. it gets a specific in other words i mean you know all he's got a way of miking and you know a particular uh just ear for it as well i mean i think that's the part that can't be reproduced is just the way it, you know having the ear and you sure. can do all you can you can follow you can probably follow all of it i'm sure he's would be happy to give anyone a tutorial on how to, you know, how he does things and what he likes. But I mean, you still have to like when he's uh, when he's flipping the polarity on a, you know, particular mic or something like that. You know, that's that's his ear. Yeah. You know, he didn't need now, schooling for that. He just he had the ear, and then he. Built, no, I mean, I'm the... sure he always. Ha I'm sure he always had that. I mean, I don't know, but I'm sure he always had that ear, and he certainly has always had more or less the same drum sound. I mean, you know, it, it changes slightly over the, over the years. Um, but, you know, I, of course I love his, 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 um, you know, staying with, to, to the, to the extent possible, staying with the analog approach, you know, and, the, sure. and tape. 
Hey, when you were staying over at his house, um, was that for uh, recording the Guided by Voices? Was that Under the Stars, or was that for something else? Yeah, yeah, that was the stuff we did the, uh, for, for... We did, like, five songs in two days, something like that. Um, we did... Uh, what did we do? We did He's the Uncle, Sheet Kickers. Like the last Color my five blade. songs or something? Yeah, well, some of it, it was... Uh, yeah, it ended up being... I mean, some of that stuff hasn't even been released, or it has been... All, everything's been released. Everything got like, by God, boy, by voices has been released. It's just whether it has been released officially or whether it was released in the unadulterated form. I mean, Bob took some of the a uh, couple of the Albini tracks and put them back on the four track and doubled his vocals because he just wasn't happy with. Oh yeah, I read that. Sound. That's weird. <laughs> he just it was just well, it was a his you know his he called he asked Steve first you know. Um, sure. And I think Steve's response was, well, this is the first time anyone's ever asked permission to make something sound worse <laughs> that I've done. That's funny. Like, and, uh, so he was sort of bemused by that. But, but, um, but yeah, I mean, um, I do remember, I, you know, we had the, uh, I don't remember who had the idea to record with them. Probably it was Kim, but, you know, um, wouldn't negotiate with, with and, this is, and this is a long saying policy, didn't like to negotiate with the band's manager. He wanted to talk to the band, sure. you know, about what they wanted and how, then how much he would charge. And and Bob, we were all scared to call him because of, because of the thing you say, because of the reputation that he had. Sure. You know, and so Bob was scared to call him, so he made me call him. <laughs> really? Um, and he to negotiate the, you know, the, what the price was going to be. And, and, uh, um, and so, and he, as you know, as you probably know, I mean, it's just so he's so accessible. You know, you just call the, you call up the studio and say, "Hey, can I talk to Steve? It's you know Jim Greer from Guided by Voices," and he just gets on the phone if he's not you know busy, obviously. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and then it was just like uh, so. You know, we wanted to come up and record, and we were wondering what it would cost. <laughs> And he's like, well, what do you think? Of, see, I can, we can't, I can't negotiate. Can you? I can't negotiate no. about yeah. this, this, to, to save my life. Luckily, like we had asked, what you know, our manager told us, like, what would be sort of a reasonable price to ask? And we kind of, I said, I suggested that, and he said, sounds good. <laughs> you know, pretty easy. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that that was easy. But he first said, you know, what you know, because he was like, you know. Well, what, said something like I think he was kind of fucking with me but um he said something like, well what would you know what is it worth to you to 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 record the album of your dreams <laughs> so you know um it's good stuff and no how point do you answer that and, yeah, 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 yeah yeah there's no there's no amount of money you know <laughs> that you can do that and uh his name's not even on the in anywhere in the booklet or the case I mean and no points taken off no, the top that's the you know? thing yeah. I, no no yeah well I mean you know he 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 would prefer, he doesn't I don't know if he, you know what his um I think he's changed his philosophy on that after uh, just with the major label bands you know I think um uh, I'm not sure if it was his idea or if it was his now wife and then girlfriend um talked him into kind of like he's like come on you know at least with the, the when you do a the, the Bush album you should take points yeah you know? that's true yeah I I don't think he did but I mean when you're dealing with major labels it's different you should you should you should take that advantage I mean don't take advantage of band I mean that was and of course, and he doesn't really care about getting credits on stuff. And he, he, he I think we credited his cat uh, <laughs> plus, which which was pretty common back then. People would do that. That's funny. <laughs> um, so we just said engineered by Fluss. Um I don't remember if we did that or Peter did that or both or whatever. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, he. It's not that it's not that he was like embarrassed to have engineered your record at all. That's not. It was the opposite of that. You know, it's just that he didn't believe he he didn't feel it was necessary to get the credit. You know, yeah, the proof's in the pudding, you know, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And um, you know, he if, if if his reputation alone was not enough for you to, if you didn't, I mean, you knew people knew, you know, you knew what he'd done, and like if you were some, if you were like, you know, whatever Robert Plant, and you wanted to record with him, and like, you know, weren't quite sure, you know, you, you know, I'm sure he would be happy to provide you with uh, examples of his work. Sure. Yeah. No. He said you his know, favorite. It's not, it's not like he's, his favorite job. He but, said was doing the latest uh, Stooges album. He said when when Iggy Pop would call him up in the morning, he would jump out of bed and just like you know do a dance. He couldn't believe it. Like, so. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> I bet. I mean, that's the yeah. That's great. I mean, that's a. I mean, 
that's amazing. But yeah, so you did Under the Stars, and uh, then for the next album, Bob, what, he pretty much shit-canned the whole lineup and got uh, some guys out of Ohio who already had a band to be his backing group, or what? Well, I mean, uh, it was a little more complicated than that. I think the band was, that lineup was going to break up anyway. I mean, I quit in like January, it's like in 96, let's say. I quit in January or February of that year. Oh, okay. uh, then, then, then Kevin had started to have some, pro- he, he was in NA and AA for a long time, and he and their European tour, he kind of fell off the wagon, and things just sort of got progressively worse with him. Um, Toby was going to quit anyway in September because just because he had uh, a kid now that had just been born, and he he didn't feel like he could tour. Okay. Um, and he thought he kind of thought you know it's it's ironic in a way, but uh, you know he he'll be the first to say this. Back back then, he thought he was too old to be doing that. <laughs> You know, like sleeping in the same room, stepping over pizza boxes in the sure. morning, you know, on tour and stuff and, and touring. And uh, he had a wife, he had a kid. Um, now he has two um, and they're grown. But he's like, I talked to him. I don't remember if this was at the reunion show or at the, the other reunion, at the latest reunion show. But his thing was like, I don't know what I was thinking back then. I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I, you know, it's like I thought I was too old to be doing this stuff, but you know, but like now I do it, and it's fine. You know, it's like I'm older, and I, it's, it, I, I, you know, it's like that bird song. Deal. I'm, I'm younger. I'm, what is it? I'm older today than I was, or no, I'm younger today yeah. than I was before, or something. Yeah. Yeah, I think Dylan wrote that. Oh, I think that's yeah. Dylan. My back page uh, cover, <laughs> but yeah, exactly. I mean, it's totally. Yeah, uh, I'm younger than that now. I know. I mean, that's that's. It's it's a weird thing, you know the the. The sort of, I mean, I, I guess. Kids probably are leaving the nest, when, and you get bored just staring at the TV. You go, man, I really wish I could be rocking right now in some place. Well, everybody thinks. I mean, you know, it's like you realize once you get older that when you thought you were old, you were you weren't old at all. Sure. Yeah. And you look at people that think that they're old when they're like, you know, when they're thirty-eight or whatever, and you're like, you're so young. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You know, you're just a kid. What are you talking about? That you know, like you should be not doing this anymore. It's like you, like the older you get, you're like. You feel like I can't believe I thought I was old back then, <laughs> but now I'm really old. But of course now, like when I get to be like, you know, like well, eighty, I'll, like, yeah. I'll probably be like, yeah, yeah, I'll be like, I'll be like, what was I thinking? <laughs> what was I thinking? I thought I was old. It's like um, Groundhog but, Day. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I also think that maybe it's just my skewed perspective being, you know, around the guy to the voices guys and stuff like that. But you know, with the, with this sort of like rash of reunion, reunited bands and stuff like that. I mean, that that you know, that sort of the age, the inherent ageism, at least of rock music, is is less explicit. It's it's still there in pop music, obviously. I, I tell my friends like when they're bummed, they're not like their demo didn't get picked up when they're age twenty seven. I say, right. check out Neil Young. Check out all these guys that are yeah. reuniting. I mean, this didn't happen in the sixties when you had like a rocker that was turning seventy and still selling out places, still making groundbreaking work. I mean, people yeah, have plenty yeah, of time yeah, now. Good. No, I mean it. It 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 is. It is a. It's a lot different. I. I. You know. I mean it's it's. It's just. A, I mean it is a function of like people. Part of it is like you know not wanting to grow up. Nobody. I mean anybody who. You know who who got into you know I mean rock music is it's a form of arrested uh, uh, development anyway. Sure, yeah. You know. It's, uh, <laughs> but but I mean it it, it the the the. the the thing about it is, you can't. It's they're they're not exclusive. The maturity and 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 rock music aren't, as it turns out, are not um, mutually exclusive. Um, and and I, I was saying, like in the future, we'll be like, oh, that guy just turned 105 and he's still selling out places. I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I yeah, I mean that probably cryogenically, you know, or at least their brain, their preserved brain in a computer sure. body will still be selling out places or something. But yeah, I mean. I mean, because you know, even as 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 relatively recently as 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 like you know, back in the mid '90s, when when you know, Guided by Voices got discovered, and Bob was 36, um, it was kind of a bit of a, a um, anomaly. Sure. You know, it was uh, considered like a story. It was an, it was newsworthy. <laughs> these old guys, you know, we, you know, it was like so weird. Yeah. You know, yeah, which which you know, and, and and he thought of himself kind of, you know, he had, he had, he was married. He had, uh, he had been teaching school for a long time. He had two kids, you know. I mean, 
and now all of a sudden he's an indie rock star, <laughs> quote unquote. Or um, you know, and and I think there was a sort of a, a little bit of cognitive dissonance as a result, but it just it became more and more normal over the years, and now it's like, um, um pretty much you know, accepted. It, it, it does, yeah. Yeah, it's accepted. I guess yeah. is, the, is the word. I don't, you know, but that's partly because I think it's partly because there are so many. Somebody actually, Newgarden told me this the other day. He said there are. Uh, was, uh, sorry, David Newgarden. He's the guy who plays voices manager, and um, he um, he's telling me that there are ten times as many bands now as there were when. You know, guy by voices was around when even the you know. True. Um, yeah. And 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 that's partly because of the internet type. You know, the way you can distribute, you can reach people um, a lot easier. You don't need the necessarily the the the, the help of a record label, at least in the beginning. You know. Um, sure. and, and then if you get popular enough, you definitely don't need it. Um, you need a label sign, sort of like in that like that that next step between like starting out. You, okay, you've got your you know a, a, some somewhat of an audience, and then but in order to get like you know big enough to be sort of self sufficient, you do I think at a certain point need some help with distribution and marketing. At some point, even if it's like on on, on the sub top level of you know, of that thing, you know the sure, stuff that yeah. Matador, the middle area. The Mat, yeah. That, yeah, that Matador did for for guided by voices, you know, it has enabled them now to reunite and and you know basically self release everything. And keep all the money. Sure. Yeah. And, and that do well works on for, for a lot of bands. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that that works for a lot of bands like Wild Flag and things that were that had that were around you know, during a time that when when they were signed to label like you know when they were on Sleeper Kinney or whatever and you know did benefit from a certain amount of promotion that sub pop from sub pop when there still was a little bit of money and there still is a lot of money in music it's just that it's spread so wide. It's spread thin. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Yeah, I mean, uh, and and also people, you know, the, the model is different. The consumption model is different. People are not used to paying for music. Once you get not used to paying for something, you you don't you can't go back to paying for it. That's true. Yeah. So so I mean, for for the actual you know for the actual music now, there's still a market for the the physical artifact, like well, for, especially with vinyl, and even now, like Fed is coming back, into, which is uh, weird to me, but. Um, yeah, and then the exactly. whole touring thing, the whole memorabilia thing. Well, touring, it's yeah. flipped around. It's, yeah. As everyone will tell you, it's flipped around to where, you know, you tour now. Uh, you put out a record to, so that you can tour yeah. um, um, to make money, whereas before you toured to support the record. Um, exactly. Now it's the opposite. <laughs> um, the, record is, the record is sort of like uh, an advertisement for, for, for the live show or the tour or whatever. Um, you don't expect to make money off the record. You expect to make money while you tour. And that's, that's true, certainly of of you know of bands that are are more established. But it's I can see how that would be hard for 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 someone just starting out because you don't you know you can't tour, um, you don't have an audience, you don't have you know and you're not going to make any money. You can, but you, I mean, it's it's it that's where it's like you know that that needs I think you have to be young to do that because if you're going to be touring the U.S. in a van relentlessly, which is what you need to do in order to establish that audience, you know, you can't have a, you know, you you have to have a lot of energy, first of all, and, sure, you, and yeah. you also have to be sort of like at that point where, you know, you, you've only, you know, you're working at Starbucks or whatever anyway, you know, so it's like, you know, fuck it, just quit your day job for a while and then go tour and then come back and get another one. Hit the road, yeah. Which, yeah, which you kind of can't do if you're older and you have a family or something like that. That's true. Speaking of starting up again, uh, the new band, Detective, how are things going with yeah. that? And uh, the singer's French, correct? Or? Yes, he's French, but, you know, lives, um, uh, she's lived in L.A. for like 12 years. So. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So, so um, but she's, yeah, she's, a, she's, she's from France. She's natively French. and um, Great voice, by but, the way. But, yeah, no, she's she's great. Um She's a great singer, great songwriter, and um, I mean, but you know, the thing we did one song in French because it was just kind of like because you can, you know, sure. type of thing. But um, but and we might do another one at some point because there's definitely an audience for that type of thing, and it's fun to do. Fun for me. I speak French as well. I mean, I'm not, you know, 
Nice. I'm not a, well, I guess, I, guess, I mean, I don't know what fluent means, really. It's not pronounced I mean, detective? Can, or? De- well, you know, we just call it detective. We, we like, you know, you can, I like to put the, the, the accent over the thing because it just, it, it, to, to differentiate us from that, that horrible 70s band with Michael DeBars. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that was, they were only around for two years. They were on Led Zeppelin's label. It was like this. So it's like instead of saying we're not that shitty band, <laughs> detective, we we're, we like we were actually it's actually spelled differently. So it's Different. like people don't get confused. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, but you know, you can call it. You know, you don't expect. I tried to teach my dad. Was like you know, my dad was actually he just he was like so how's it pronounced. And, He's like detective, and I'm like, no, it's detective. You know, I'm like trying to give him the French pronunciation, and he's like, I speak French, I know he doesn't. Speak French. <laughs> he doesn't. Like, no, <laughs> I know him, but he's like, je parle français. I'm like, no, you don't. I'm du uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so it's like, no, no, you know, don't expect anyone to be, to pronounce it anything other than detective, because that's and it's named after the the Godard movie, which uh, of the same name. It's not one of his more well known movies, but I thought it was. We, we thought it was a funny. Reference because um, well we are half French you know as a band and also you know I'm you know very much into French film French film and culture um, yeah yeah in general especially film um, not music because they don't have much in the way of music but um, but uh, but this movie had um, speaking of that it had like um, had Johnny Halliday in it which is, who is like the cheesiest big French pop star he still is I mean um, even though he's like seventy but he's like the French, I don't know what, Elvis or something, but like Elvis <laughs> in Vegas type of. Elvis. Oh, I got you. Nice. Um, and they love him over there. They, they worship. There are people that genuinely worship him and worship his music and stuff. And he's just you can't. And they they don't like it when you. Can like, like a like a David Hasselhoff or. <laughs> type of that on that level, kind of on that level nice. of cheesiness. Um, but sort of more of a culture, more of a cultural icon, and people actually take him seriously, which is oh. the, the funny thing. And so, I mean, you know, Godard cast him in this movie. He can act. He's acted like he's actually acted in some fairly decent movies. But it's not it's his music that's really you know the problem. <laughs> um, but so it, that it's funny just because of that. You know, I think he, I, you know, I, um, just because he's such a cheesy icon in France, <laughs> and so we, you know, I thought that that was a good reference, even though it's very obscure and no one will get it, and um, it doesn't matter. But yeah, I mean, it's 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 great. I mean, I I um I had not expected to be back playing music again, but once I started doing it, which was sort of like on a a whim, more or less, not a whim, but it wasn't really a planned thing. Um, I, I found it uh so much fun that I was just like, let's just keep doing it. Let's do it, you know, for real. And, um, and yeah, we recorded the, the, the basket of mass CP in like two days. And, and, um, and I sent it to Bob, like I did send it to him. I mean, he didn't like hear it out of the blue, but I, you know, with some trepidation cause he hates everything. Literally. <laughs> he just does not like, he doesn't think anything good has been made. Uh, in music since uh, 1982, I think would be where he, he would stop. And uh, but he called me up like, like the next day and was like, you know, telling me how great he, how much he loved it, and said, you know, we're we're, we're taking you on tour and all this stuff. And I was like, wow, that's nice. nice. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, I mean, obvious an obvious thing that I mean in doing the band. I don't know if I would. I, I don't think I would do it at this age if I was just starting a band out of like uh, out of, in a vacuum or something like that. If I didn't hadn't already done stuff, because it it is an advantage, you know, frankly, having you know having friends in high so, places, you know, yeah, definitely. yeah, or in having and having been in a band and having some level of you know uh, recognition in that in that uh, to that aspect of it, because you know it's it's just easier to you know then you can just book, you know book show. and you know in L A. Obviously, you know, Dylan's been in um, in bands around here for the last ten years, so she can, you know, she could already, we, you know, book shows around here, you know, on Pretty the basis easy. of nice. what she's done. Um, but you know, nationally, you know, it's now, you know, we we have a booking agent, you know, which you know would not be is not usually possible for a band that's only been around for like six months. <laughs> that's um, awesome. Yeah. But you know, because we're gonna do, you know, we're gonna do a. a 
you know, West Coast tour in January and probably, you know, a whole, you know, we, we plan to do a lot of touring, not just this little thing, because I like playing live. You know, it's fun. Oh, of course. And we've written a bunch more songs and we have a new, you know, we have, we've already, uh, we've got a new record that's... Um, you know, a full length coming um, out? Or? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and then we'll, we plan to record more after that. It's just, it, it's partly, I didn't realize it almost unconsciously I'd been sort of I had this sort of stockpile of songs that had been that I'd written in in the intervening years since I stopped really playing music and because um, um, I got into screenwriting and you know I just didn't have time exactly yeah I, I had a guitar I'd pick up my guitar every once in a while and mess around with it and well, who produced that. that EP? It's it sounds awesome, by the way. Very layered and. Uh, well, no, we did. I mean, it was just uh, again, it wasn't really produced. Yeah, I mean, it was like we went up to um, Yelen is friends with this guy um, who played in a band called the Grigri, a garage band called uh, Greg Ashley has his own studio up in Oakland, and, and he records the tape. Still, it was like a sixteen track no, no. thing, and we just went up there and in, in two days recorded and mixed the whole thing. But it's basically. It's it's very strict. I mean, it's like what we played is what's on there. We didn't we did a minimum of of overdubs. We did a minimum of takes, definitely. Um, Rory, the drummer, is amazing. He's like had heard the songs like once or twice. We practiced once, I think, before we went Whoa. to record. You know huh. what I mean? <laughs> and uh, and with the new one, which is even even more, we, he he was even more. He he. He didn't listen to the song. He listened to he, he but he deliberately did not listen to the songs until we went into the into the um, studio. And again, I think we did all the songs in like like four or five hours um, <laughs> over over two days. But you know, he just made he made up his parts. Um, he, I mean, he, he had cheated, I and mean, he had listened, I think, a little bit to the to the demos um, that we had sent him. But but for for the most part, he wanted to just like kind of wing it. That's chops. And right the, there. The, yeah. we, we, well, it is, and it's also just like it, it's more fun than to do that. Like none of us, not, I'm not saying, you know, we're not, you know, I'm not Bob Pollard level p- impatient, but but neither Gillen nor I has a lot of patience for the the studio thing. We don't like to do, I, and I just think that's that's a, a, in terms of an aesthetic. It's like you know, doing more than two or three takes is just you know beating. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's just, you know, everything is live as possible. Obviously, we'll go back in and overdub stuff. I mean, you know, um, you know, do add add guitars and keyboards if 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 you hear something, and then vocals is you know, you know, take some time. But especially Gwen takes time because she has a really good voice and she can do harmonies, um, really great harmonies with herself, and then harmonies on my songs too. Whereas you know, I'm just like. Uh, my voice is my voice, you know. I mean, I can't even. Sure. Um, not your forte. Not... Yeah, it's not. It's not, my, it's not my strong suit. Um, but you know, I mean, I like. You know, it's like it's it it is. It's okay for what you know for for what I need it to be for my songs. But you know. Sure. But yeah, her her, her voice is definitely. Um, uh, I think the highlight. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, one of the highlights. One of the, the highlights, band, definitely. You know? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's about it for uh, our hour here. Um, I could probably okay. go on for two or three hours, but uh, I know. I guess, I'm sorry. I probably, I probably talk too much. I, no, it's I, great. I, I just appreciate you taking the time out. And uh, yeah, so you, you got a brief history. The Guided by Voices book that came out in what 2005 or 2005. It came out. Yeah, um, and I I keep you know, I have a I, I, we asked the publisher, do you want an updated one? And they were like, no. I mean, publishers are idiots. Yeah. There should be an updated one. I, I, I've talked about doing a, a sort of like a follow-up in more in the form of a, a memoir, you know, like a personal account, um, because I think there might be some interest in that. So I might do that at some point. Um, Very cool. But, you know, more more I've just been co- concentrating on the novels and then on the, you know, screenwriting, which you know, is more like pays the bills type of thing. Definitely. Yeah, check out Artificial um, Light and The Failure. Those are in most bookstores, right? Yeah. Yep. All the yep. bookstores that are left, so not borders. All the bookstores <laughs> that are left, standing, yeah, I know. Just like record stores. Yeah, I told somebody on my show, I said, uh, I'm I'm writing my uh, my autobiography right now, and it's going to be sold exclusively at Borders Bookstores. And the guy laughed. <laughs> but, yeah, find you on the net. That What's that, jamesgreer.net? Yes, yes. And, and what's um, the north and... of Anhava mean? What? 
Oh, that's a reference to, um, that's a kind of obscure literary reference. It's, uh, it's a reference to Nabokov, who's one of my favorite uh, writers, and um, to the novel Pale Fire. There's, okay. a, there's, a, there's an index in, it's a Pale Fire, and in the index, um, uh, the location of the, 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 it's kind of an in-joke for Nabokov fanatics, which I guess I'm more of a fanatic of him than I am of music. <laughs> um, but, um, but sort of like, it's in, in the index, there's this, this one entry that gives the location of the crown jewels, uh, and it's like somewhere north of, in a barracks north of Anhava. And so I just, oh, nice. so I like that. <laughs> it's like, it's just a reference. It's, yeah, cool. it's my favorite author, basically. <laughs> Awesome, yeah, and check uh, check you out on Twitter. That is N O O N H A V A, right? That's correct. And uh, I don't know why I, I I couldn't have made it more difficult. Noon Hava. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so Jim Greer dot net. That's where you find all about the books. Find all about you know the songs he's did and the new detective project too. That's on iTunes, right? Yep. Yep. Awesome, yep. and you're, they're gonna be hitting the road too this fall, opening up for Guided by Voices, right? That's correct. Awesome. Any 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 last thing you want to share? Or? Uh, uh, no, it's been a pleasure. Uh, uh, thanks for having me, and um, um, I uh. I hope that your autobiography. I look forward to reading your autobiography. <laughs> nice. Borders. Awesome. Yeah. Just uh, just wait outside the store. It'll open up any day now. Okay. Um, okay. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you so much for taking the time out. And uh, yeah, on behalf of Jim Greer, this is Andy Dare signing off for the Andy Dare Show. Be sure to follow Andy on Twitter. That's at Andy Dare. A N D Y D R E R. And like our show on Facebook. That's Facebook.com slash The Andy Dare Show. Videos at YouTube.com slash Andrew Martin Dare. And it all leads back to The Andy Dare Show.com. Support our show by supporting our sponsors Uncle Bub's award winning barbecue, The Mandrate, and Secondhand Ball. Thank you so much for listening.